Longine watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and more honors for accuracy than any other timepiece. Longine, the world's most honored watch, is made and guaranteed by the Longine Whitnall Watch Company. It's time for the Longine Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longine Whitnall Watch Company. Maker of Longine, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longine. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co editors for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope? Mr. Victor Rizel, labor columnist for the New York Daily Mirror, and Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Mr. Arthur Garfield Hayes, famed constitutional lawyer and general counsel for the Civil Liberties Union. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speaker. Mr. Hayes, our chronoscope audience knows you, sir, as a long-time crusader for human freedom, and I'm sure they'll be very much interested in your views tonight. Now, sir, we had uh, Senator McCarthy on this show uh, a few days ago, and our audience had his views. Now, what is your general appraisal of, ge of Senator McCarthy and his work, sir? I think he's the most dangerous man in the United States. I think Senator McCarthy is more dangerous to freedom in the United States than all the communists we have in this country. Well, Mr. Hayes, uh, do you think that because he's attacking communism? And I disagree with the senator. Do you uh, think that he's dangerous because he's attacking communism? No, I think, think he's dangerous because without sufficient evidence, he's smearing a lot of respected and highly decent people. Well, do you think, Mr. Hayes, that there are communists in the State Department? Have they infiltrated our government? I don't think for a moment they've begun to infiltrate the government. I think there may be a few communists in the State Department, but they don't do nearly, nearly as much harm as a suspicion that's stirred up against the whole State Department by a man like McCarthy and his ill and his followers. Well, yeah. what... What specific harm do you think Senator McCarthy has done? Well, I think when you smear men like Owen Lattimore and Philip Jessup, Jessup who's done a great job for the United Nations, and when you throw suspicion on men who've been in government service for years and make people doubt their own State Department, you do a great deal of harm because you stir up hate and suspicion and fear all over the United States. I think the most dangerous thing the communists can do in the United States is stir up hate, suspicion, and fear. And I think anybody who aids them to do it is doing as bad a job as they are. Do you think that there is any ground for suspicion and fear among the people of the United States, sir? No reasonable ground. And I think that no man should be deprived of his reputation and standing without a fair trial and a judgment according to Anglo-Saxon method. But don't and not by the ravings of McCarthy, even though he has congressional immunity. But don't you think that the American people, sir, have some reason uh, to suspect there's a State Department that harbors a hiss or that harbors people that are known to be subversive and to be agents of foreign powers. I don't think American people have any sound reason to suspect our State Department at present. Well, Mr. Hayes, sound reason. We're going to separate this from Senator McCarthy immediately. We agree. We if dismiss it. If you separate him. sound reason from Senator McCarthy, you and I are on the same side. All of right, the well taken. We agree and we dismiss him. Now, uh, Owen Lattimore, don't you think he's a danger as a friend of Matsudong, the commander of the army that's fighting our own United Nations? For 15 years, Owen Lattimore has been Matsudong's friend. Now, do you think that doesn't constitute a danger to the thinking of our State Department? No, I don't, because I've seen nothing or heard of nothing that he has done, that Owen Lattimore has done. That seems to me to suggest for a moment that he isn't a loyal American. Well, now, uh, let's come, let's do this, sir. Uh, we, personalities are very interesting. But let's come to McCarthy's methods, which are the things that you are, you most oppose. Now, you, you're at your position that his methods have not been justified. It is. Now, uh, a great many Americans, however, believe that the one reality of our time is uh, the Soviet power, and that that Soviet power is aided in the United States by people uh, who are willing to lend their aid to that Soviet power. Soviet you, you power in Russia is one thing. Soviet power in the United States, I don't think, exists. 
But no. you, you do exist that there are, you do admit that there are Americans who want to make Russia more powerful and that there have been such Americans in, inside our own government. Yes, but very few in number. Mr. Hayes. And exercising, in my judgment, no influence. Mr. Hayes, don't you think that 500,000 Americans led by uh, Stalinists, labor leaders, are a menace, especially when in the heart of our defense industry? And I could when do you them. get 500,000 Stalinists? The 500,000 Americans are members of trade unions led in the heart of our defense industry by communist labor leaders. Don't you think that constitutes a menace to our civil liberties? I don't, because I think it'll work itself out the same as it has in the CIO. At one time, the communists are very strong in the CIO. Then the communists began playing politics instead of attending the labor union duties, and they were thrown out of practically all the CIO unions. But they have... Every time I read of a strike, I don't attribute it to communists. They no. don't deserve the credit. No, no, we're going to dismiss that one, too. We're not going to... All right, I'm glad now, you agree with me Now, the, don't you think that though the organized conspiracy of American Stalinism with 43,000 fanatics represents a threat to American civil liberty? No, I don't. I think all those people are under surveillance by the FBI. I think they might be fifth columnists in case of war. I don't think they're potential spies because spies aren't used who are under suspicion. And I trust the FBI and I trust the laws. Then, well, if what you're trying to tell me is that we have a right to violate laws of decency as well as the laws in the statute books in order to get communists, what you're really saying is that a totalitarian government over here would be safer than a democratic government, and I don't believe it. Let me say, Mr. Hayes, I'm for decency. I wanted to make that well, clear. I'm, well, I'm, I thought you were. That's why I thought your argument wasn't sound. Well, I'm delighted that both you gentlemen are for decency, but let's come back to, to the State Department. And uh, uh, don't you think, sir, that Senator McCarthy's just, uh, methods might be justified and that the House on american Activities uh, Committee's methods might be justified because of a failure on the department, on, on a part of the Department of Justice. After all, uh, the FBI knew of the existence of Alger Hiss for four or five years before he was Oh, well, I'll grant you Hiss, but for heaven's sake, you're not going to fund all your policy on the fact that one man was found guilty of having done something improper in 1938 and lied about it in 1948. Don't you think... Certainly that, you're not going to take that position. Mr. Hayes, don't you think that the State Department, having worked us into this Holocaust in the East, has failed because of the policies, which I think pro-communist policies... Of well, I don't Latimer, think the State Department led us into the Holocaust in the East. What did, Mr. Hayes? The uh, invasion from North Korea of the communists. Who was responsible for that? I think the communists were responsible. And behind for them? Russia, of course. And therefore, you don't think that the same extension of the same conspiracy in the United States represents a threat to us? Yes, but I don't see the same conspiracy in the United States. I'm not afraid of the communists in the United States. There never has been a more futile political movement in the United States than that of communism. After 25 years, they can't get enough votes to keep their name on the ballot. This idea of finding a communist stone under the bed seems to me all nonsense. And the result of the whole thing is that Americans now are so timid about expressing themselves that we've practically given up democratic methods and free speech. Nobody in this country dares what he dares to say. Anything that might suggest to anybody that he's an appeaser or pro-Russian or anything else. The result is that we act as one and even on controversial subjects. We don't find any debate in public life. Well, and as, as and a, don't dare. As a, as a liberal, sir, and a believer in human freedom, you deplore the fact that Americans do not have that or utilize that liberty as they once did. Why, surely, as soon as you get to a position where you have a timid public as you have today, that is the end of free speech. It's just as serious as for Congress to pass laws. I think we're a whole lot safer and healthier if every man says exactly what he believes. Now, to, to relate your views to the political issues of 1952, sir, yeah. Uh, where, where do you stand? Are you going to, do you expect to support Truman in 52? I do unless Eisenhower's nominated. If Eisenhower's nominated, I'd probably support him. Why? Because as president of Columbia, I heard Eisenhower speak on democracy, and he thrilled me. And I think his views are what I regard as democratic views. Would you make those specifics, sir? We've been trying to get some of those views from him, and he has refused. Well, I think if you read the past prints and read his speeches, you find that he's opposed to the present hysteria. He's opposed to things that make us all fearful of communists. He believes in people audaciously expressing themselves. And he believes that the atmosphere of today is very bad. Do you think 
the general was a liberal or a conservative by your standards, Mr. Hayes? That's hard to tell. I, I don't use terms liberal or, or conservative. Would you vote for him on the Republican ticket, sir? Yes. Uh, the party of McCarthy? <coughs> well, I regard as the party of Eisenhower. <laughs> All right. I would so regard. What, how do you regard Senator Taft? He's, he's a man who is supposed to have considerable respect for the law. And as a lawyer yourself, I should think that would attract you to Senator Taft. I have respect for Senator Taft as a man. I think he's able and honest. And uh, I, uh, I like the way he handled himself in general. But Senator Taft to me is, is more or less of a, a metal machine. And I hadn't the same liking or admiration for him personally that I would have for either Eisenhower or Truman. Now, I'm sure that our audience would like to hear one last expression from you, sir. Uh, as a fighter for human liberty for many, many years in this country, are you hopeful about the prospects for liberalism as you define it in America in 1952? Yes, I am, because I've seen the same hysteria exist. I saw it exist in the 20s when the socialists were the target. The party to the left is always the target. Someday we'll have a party more radical than the communists, and then the communists will be respectable. I think this idea of, of becoming fearful because of names is all absurd. I have the same hope that we'll reach a sane atmosphere in the future as uh, uh, turned out after the 1920s. Well, I'm sure that our audience very much appreciates these views, sir, and thank you for being with us, sir. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was... Mr. Victor Rizel and Mr. William Bradford Huey. Our distinguished guest was Mr. Arthur Garfield Hayes, famed constitutional lawyer and general counsel for the Civil Liberties Union. You know, one gets nowhere either in love or in business by being subtle. Just ask for what you want simply and directly. Isn't that good advice? Now, if you're one of the thousands who's always wanted a long jean watch. Don't beat around the bush, just ask for it. Just say, I would love to get a long jean watch. Christmas, you know, is just around the corner. And just around the corner, too, is a long jean Whitnor jeweler agency with many wonderful long jean Christmas gift watches, product of 85 years of fine watchmaking experience, each individually worthy of the great honors which long jean watches have won. 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and highest honors for accuracy from the leading government observatories. The watch of first choice in fields of precise timing, in sports, aviation, in exploration and science. Believe me, throughout the world, no other name on a Christmas watch means so much in beauty, in accuracy, and long life as Longines, the world's most honored watch. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. And you may buy and proudly give a Longines watch this Christmas for as little as $71.50. This is Frank Knight again inviting you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for The Longine Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longine, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longine, sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. This is the CBS Television Network.